going to be back in Mark chapter 9. Got just a little bit left in 9. We might get in to 10. As I was looking ahead, I got into some things that were very interesting to me. So if we've got a little bit of time, I'd like to, to keep going forward. We're going to start in 942. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. We just got finished with a little section about uh, folks that were casting out demons in Jesus' name. And John wanted to know, should we tell them to stop? Or actually, John told them to stop. And Jesus says, well, if they're not against us, they're for us. And then suddenly we change subjects, and we're talking about little children. And so David and I talked about this a little bit last week. But uh, let's get your input on it. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go into hell where the fire never goes out. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm that uh, eats them does not die and the fire is not quenched. And you might have noticed if you're in the King James or the New King James that that last uh, phrase, the worm's, uh, that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched is repeated a couple of other times at the end of some of those phrases. Uh, just depends on which of the old manuscripts they were using at the time. Most modern translations only have it the one time rather than the three times. Uh, the, the first question and perhaps one of the most important questions is, who are these little ones we're talking about? If it has any connection at all, to those who were casting out demons in Jesus' name, then you'd have to say, well, there are people who are beginning to embrace the faith to some degree, but so far have not fully become Christians or have not fully become disciples of Christ. Uh, John told some folks to stop doing things in Jesus' name. Would that be what Jesus was talking about, causing them to stumble? stopping them from doing something in Jesus' name because they're not us. Uh, so it would keep them from growing. Or are we talking about little humans? Right? A lot of times when you see the phrase, uh, these little ones, you're talking about little ones. It hasn't been very long since Jesus took a little child, brought him into the middle of the group and said, if you want to be the master of all, you've got to be the servant of everybody. Uh, in other passages, he says, uh, unless you become like a little child, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. So he, he literally talks about little children on a lot of occasions. Which do you think this is? Are we talking about young believers, meaning not yet mature in the faith, or are we talking about little humans? What do you think? Young believers? I think most of us are in agreement that we're talking about young believers, not little humans. Um, he uses the same language here that he uses in Matthew 5 when he's talking about adultery. So the worst possible ap application would be that if a, an adult human is doing something to a baby human or a young human, that would be sexual in nature, adulterous in nature. I don't think that's where this passage goes, but I want us to look at the language uh, Jesus uses this language on more than one occasion to describe uh, how important it is to seek the things of the kingdom even uh, at the cost of physical normality. All right, look at Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body 
than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So we have a little bit more in Mark than we do in Matthew. In Mark, we have the, uh, the additional phrase where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. And we have the addition of feet, right? If your feet are causing you to, uh, to sin, then it's better to, to be footless than to have both feet enter, in, enter into hell. Uh, and the word hell here in both places is Gehenna, and we've talked about that before. That's a valley outside of Jerusalem where the garbage was sent. Right? So uh, when people come by your house and pick up your garbage from your house, uh, they take it out to the dump. Uh, out to the, dump. Uh, the dump here is a lot cleaner place than the dump was outside of Jerusalem. Outside of Jerusalem uh, were dead carcasses, fires were always burning, worms never died. It was a horrible stench of a place. Right now, if you go to the Valley of Hinnom, outside of Jerusalem, it's a park. So, you know, hundreds of years of nastiness has all been covered up, and it's a green space, and you can take your walk there and, and feel good about life and watch the sunset. And it's a beautiful place. But in the time of Jesus, it was a place that you would look over the wall and see this horrible uh, sight down in the valley. And so Jesus used it as a way of illustrating being absent from God. If you go to hell, that's what hell is like. Uh, the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. So when we think about uh, the fires of hell, part of that understanding is the way Jesus described it to his disciples. That uh, It's an eternal place. The worm never dies. The fire never goes out. It's a place of filthiness, a place of separation. Uh, if something was unclean in Jerusalem, what would you do with it? You take it to the Valley of Hinnom and get rid of it. So unclean things, horrible things, uh, worms and fire and you know, the, the wor worst possible things that you can imagine were out there rather than uh, in among the good folks in Jerusalem. Uh, verse 49 is an oddity and verse 50 uh, goes with it. Everyone will be salted with fire. Everyone will be salted with fire. And then he follows that up with salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Now again, you go back to the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, then it's no good for anything except to be cast out onto the street and people just walk on it. It's useless. But what does he mean here? Everyone will be salted with fire. And salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves. Who is the yourselves? The disciples, right? He's talking to his disciples. Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. This may be a carryover from their discussions of who's going to be the greatest, right? Uh, James and John talking about we're better than everybody else, uh, infighting within the disciples. Maybe Jesus brings that back around in this final little remark before they move on. Uh, a few passages we can look at that might help us in the Old Testament. Look at Leviticus chapter 2. It's the third one. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Chapter 2 and we'll look at verse 13. And these are a little archaic without explanation. So I'll give you what explanation I know. Chapter 2 verse 13. Season all of your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all of your offerings. So it's kind of a recipe book if you're just an outsider looking in. But the salt was a way of solidifying the fact that you're making a covenant. So in their culture, in their understanding, 
when you shared a meal and you shared salt, it was a combining agent. It was something that was important that you had together. So God says when you bring these grain offerings, don't leave out the salt. It could have been something as a, a gesture toward the Levites, right? They're taking care of your uh, salted uh, sacrifices. So they're going to have salt in their meal that they have following the sacrifice. But it was a way of saying if, if you share salt, if you have the salt together, then it's a covenant. It's a, a binding covenant. Look at Numbers 18. One more book over. Numbers 18 and the verse, uh, verse 19. Again, tribe of Levite. Chapter 18. Numbers 18. Verse 19. Whatever is set aside from the holy offerings the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and daughters as your perpetual share. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and your offspring. So God says this is a covenant of salt. It's a binding deal. May have been why he told the Israelites when you bring your offerings, make sure there's salt in it. It's a reminder that the tribe of Levite is worthy, because I make them worthy, to receive all of these gifts from you. They're making sacrifices to God, but that's the way the tribe of Levite received their stuff. They didn't have a territory of their own. They lived among the people. The people took care of them. Right? So here we have a covenant of salt with the tribe of Levi to, uh, to make sure that the Israelites understand that this is an ongoing uh, relationship between Levi and the people. Yes, sir. Salt's necessary for life. Is that tie into this? Or? It could very well that that uh, he said salt is necessary for life. So it's it's a life giving thing, and that's one of the reasons Jesus says, you know, if if the salt loses its saltiness, what's it good for? It's just a white, crumbly something. You know, you just throw it out. Uh, look at Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter 13. That's after Kings, right? First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 13. Who do you reckon, if you were just guessing, God makes a covenant of salt with? In Second Chronicles, which king would have been really important to God in that regard? Second Chronicles 13, verse 5. Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? So if you guessed David, you were correct. Uh, so you see what this salt has to do. Now, how do we put this together with everyone will be salted with fire? Well, fire and salt were necessary for sacrifices, so maybe Jesus had the sacrificial system in mind. Uh, maybe he has in mind that the covenant that was coming is going to be a covenant of fire right on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes with tongues of fire, and that solidifies the covenant. Right? The covenant is made sure by the Holy Spirit. So maybe the Holy Spirit is equal, perhaps, uh, to the salt in this passage. So there's all kinds of different possibilities. The one thing to take away from it, though, is salt is a, a covenant of salt is a way of saying that this is permanent that this is always going to be true. So everyone being uh, being salted with fire may have something to do with that everlasting nature of God's covenant. All right? Now the second part, verse 50, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. The last phrase really helps us with the rest of it. Right? If you guys are going to work together, if you guys are going to be my representatives to the people, 
then you need to be at peace with each other. How do you get to that level of peace? You share salt with each other, right? So we think more in terms of bread, right? If you break bread together, that's a sign of uh, community. It's a sign of uh, camaraderie. But they also had in mind salt. So you shared bread and you shared salt, and that was a binding contract. So perhaps what Jesus is saying to them is that saltiness is important to the covenant, and as you guys are living out this covenant, you need to be at peace with each other. So share in this covenant of salt, share in this new covenant, share in the fire, but do it at peace with each other. So again, kind of an odd ending to chapter 9. And we do have some time, so let's get into chapter 10. Any questions on 9? That's about all I know about it, so... I think the idea is that to be salty with one another is to be connected to each other, to have peace, to have uh, a covenant with each other. Uh, the only one that we would know of that was in this conversation that didn't was Judas. Uh, he, his covenant of salt wasn't worth the salt. Uh, and then when Jesus says, if the salt is no longer salty, what good is it? Right. So if you guys don't hold together... If the salt isn't there, if the saltiness gives away, it's useless, right? If you guys don't stick together, this isn't going to work. So it may very well be that Jesus is just telling the disciples, you need to make sure that you're solid together. And so sharing salt would be making sure that their relationships with each other were as strong as they needed to be. That's why I think maybe it goes back to James and John saying, Who's going to be the best in the kingdom? And all the disciples are having this conversation when Jesus is trying to teach them about resurrection and about the kingdom and all the things that they're going to need to share. They're dividing themselves up into who's the best. So, you know, that's think about a, a, a basketball team. And there are plays that are drawn up, and then you have a kid that's a ball hog. And so he doesn't share salt with the rest of the team. And the whole offense falls apart. Or he's a showboat on defense, and so he doesn't keep his position. He's running all over the place trying to do his own thing on defense. And it just confuses and throws everything into turmoil while the rest of the team is trying to have a solid defense. So Jesus tells the disciples, if you're going to work as a team, you've got to have this saltiness among yourself. You've got to be together in how you do this thing. So it, it's not about the individual, it's about the group coming together. So hopefully that's uh, what Jesus was talking about. If not, he'll correct us later. <laughs> we'll, we'll understand it one of these days. Uh, chapter 10. Jesus left that place and went to the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. So same kind of setting. You've got Jesus with large crowds coming up, and people are asking him questions, and he's giving them discourses on what he wants them to know. And some Pharisees came and tested him, asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, immediately when I see the Pharisees came, I have a bad taste in my mouth. Right? The Pharisees were always the problems. Go back to Matthew uh, 5, uh, 5, 6, 7, when he's in the Sermon on the Mount. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees uh, and the Sadducees, or, or the Pharisees and the scribes, you'll never get into heaven. Right? You'll never be in the kingdom of heaven. So people held them in high regard. They held themselves in very high regard. And so they come in front of all these people to test Jesus. But there's, there's an undercurrent here that probably these Pharisees, unless they were all from the same little sect of the Pharisees, didn't agree with each other about this question. There was a lot of discussion in the Sanhedrin about this very thing. Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? And some important players 
had been in on this conversation in the last hundred years before they were asking this question. One of them was about to die. His name was Shammai. Rabbi Shammai was close to 80 years old and had been the president of the Sanhedrin for a lot of that time. He was a Pharisee. Uh, He had come into power while Rabbi Hillel was still the president of the council. So the two of them had kind of worked together, but they didn't agree on everything. Rabbi Hillel had died several years prior to this. His son, uh, Simeon, had a son named Gamaliel. Familiar with Gamaliel? Gamaliel was the teacher of the Apostle Paul. So that, that side of the equation was from Rabbi Hillel, and then Rabbi Shammai was still alive, but very, very old and and not as active as he had been before. But here's the way it it broke down. Rabbi Hillel was more liberal, more relaxed in his interpretation of the law. His understanding of divorce was, if she burns the pot roast, you can get rid of her. You don't have to worry about divorce regulations. Uh, It was a very open kind of understanding uh, as far as marriage was concerned. Rabbi Shammai, who was about 60 years younger than Rabbi Hillel, was kind of mentored by him coming up, but he was much more uh, conservative. And in his mind, the only way that you could get a divorce, if there was any reason at all, was for adultery. So Shammai and Jesus would have been fairly connected as far as their understanding of marriage and divorce was concerned. So not all Pharisees had the same idea. Some were still very connected to Hillel. You can imagine Gamaliel was sitting on the council at this time. So Gamaliel and Shammai would have been different, but it was kind of cordial differences. They they liked each other. They wrote a lot of things together, uh, Hillel and Shammai did. Uh, in fact, when you hear one of them mentioned in Jewish conversation, it's Pretty much, you know, Hillel and Shammai, or Shammai and Hillel, they were, you know, kind of connected together as uh, co-workers rather than enemies within the uh, council, but different, at least, in the way that they would address marriage. So a bunch of uh, Pharisees come up to Jesus and ask him this question, and there's just a lot more to the question than, what do you think about marriage and divorce? They've got, you know, there's maybe some of them that are wanting Jesus to say the right thing so they can go back and tell the council, hey, Jesus agrees with Shammai. Or some of them may want Jesus to agree with Gamaliel or with Hillel. So, you know, there's there's some underlying politics going on. It's the kind of question you would ask somebody who was running for president, right? It's, it's, a, it's a trap. Uh, there's no no right answer as far as, all the constituents are concerned. Somebody's going to not like the answer that you give. So Jesus gives an answer, like I said, that kind of lines up with what Shammai would have thought. Um, what did Moses command you, he said. So we're going to be law keepers. We're going to make sure that we follow what the law says. But they say Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Okay, so... Uh, Hillel would have been happy with that. Perhaps Gamaliel would have been okay with that. It is better, uh, or it is because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. At the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together... Let no one separate. So we're used to his teaching there. Matthew 19 has kind of the same type of, uh, of teaching on marriage and divorce. Um, it, it's so simplistic that it's difficult. You know what I'm saying? Uh, people have wrestled with this even still. And so uh, when you say, what does the Church of Christ believe about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? It depends on which church of Christ you're worshiping with, which group, their minister, who their elders are, what, you know, all of the churches of Christ don't believe exactly the same thing. 
because some of them are under the influence of teachers that disagree on the subject. And if you had the two teachers together, uh, they would eat lunch together and love up on each other and care about each other. Same kind of thing that was going on with Hillel and Shammai goes on in modern churches. People that love each other and care about each other have differences of how they understand even what Jesus said in answer to this seemingly simple question. So it's, it's not uh, an easy thing to nail down. Uh, but in Matthew 19, uh, there is a uh, very public conversation, and the disciples ask the following question. Now in Mark, it's later when they're alone. Uh, verse 10, when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Okay, that's very conservative, very straight, hard to misunderstand. Right? There's, there's not much uh, misunderstanding in what he says here or what he says in Matthew 19, at least in the way I understand things. But in 19, the disciples ask him another question. Right? Go over to Matthew 19. And this, we don't have the separation. This seems to be um, still in general congregation, not by themselves. Matthew 19, beginning in verse 10. The rest of it's almost identical, very similar. Verse 10, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to get married. Right? If you can't get rid of her, don't get married. Where are we in 2024? This is, this is the ruling opinion. Right? Divorce is bad. We don't want to get divorced, so don't get married. Unfortunately, what's the new answer to that question? We'll just live together. Right? Um, when I was a young minister, there was a statistic going around, and again, you can make statistics say anything, but the statistic was eight out of ten young women will have sex before they get married. Right? So 80%. And, you know, that rocked my world because I thought good girls didn't, but evidently good girls did. But uh, eight out of ten would have sex before marriage. The new statistic is eight out of ten young people, uh, male and female, will live with someone before they get married. It's amazing to me that there's that much cohabitation. Uh, it, was a, it was a joke when we were kids. It was a joke when we were young people, talking about people shacking up, people cohabiting. It was something that other people did. Well, now it's the most common form of relationship between two people. More people live together than get married. The divorce rate is down, but that's because nobody's getting married, right? Uh, there's a whole new field of study in marriage uh, counseling that has to do with if they lived together first, that changes all of the statistics on how long they, you know, how long did they live together? Were they engaged before they moved in together? Did they get engaged while they were living together? Uh, all of those things alter the statistics if they go ahead and get married later on. So it, it's just a whole new world when we think about this. But one of the disciples says, Jesus, if we can't divorce our wives, isn't it better to just not get married? Now, I want to know how many of them were married I assume uh, most of the disciples were married. And I would love to know which one of the guys spoke up. Who was it that said, Jesus, you know, cut us a break here. Uh, I've, I've got one on the hook, but I'm not sure I want to keep her for the rest of my life. Isn't it better if we just don't get married at all? Well, here's Jesus' answer. Not everyone can accept this word. Only those to whom it's been given. There are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. There are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept this. So Jesus says, if you don't want to get married, that's fine. But not everybody can do that. 
Paul says the same thing in uh, 1 Corinthians 6. He's giving out all those, all that advice on marriage and divorce. He, he goes through the whole gamut answering questions that the Corinthians had asked him. And he says, you know, I wish that everybody was like me, meaning single. If you're single, all you have to think about is the Lord and his work. If you're married, you have to think about your wife too. You've got other things that you have to deal with. Well, here's Jesus' take on that. And he tells this disciple, you know, uh, if that's the life you want to choose for yourself, to not be married, to live a celibate life, he, he doesn't assume that they would be single and playing around. He assumes that to be single meant to be celibate. And so if you want to live that way, some people do that for the kingdom of heaven. More power to you. But don't expect everybody else to have the same opinion. Don't expect that everybody else would need to live that way.